presentation? Is that? <laughs> there we go. Right, anyway. So, good evening, everybody. My name is Harry Smith, and I am an aeronautical engineer. Now, I wish I could tell you I was coming to, to, coming to talk to you about my research, that it was a hypersonic scramjet, or a transorbital rocket booster, or anything else that sounded even remotely sexy. But it's not. I am the propeller fella. I deal with aircraft propellers. <laughs> so I'm actually going to take this off because it makes it look like I've been involved tonight to meet some sort of quota. But... <laughs> the, uh, the big question I'm always asked when I talk about my PhD, I deal with propellers. People always say, why propellers? Surely all aircrafts use jet engines these days. And mostly they're right. So I've kind of got to give you a bit of a background here. Oh, no, no, wait. Right, so the first, first aircraft took to the skies. December 17th, 1903. It was the right flyer, and it was powered by two propellers. So at 113 years old, I can't say the propellers are new, they're not cutting edge, but they do represent a really important part of the future of aviation. And the reason for that is simple. Jet engines are great. They make aircraft go fast, go high, and they get you from A to B in speedy time. But does anyone know what jet engines run on? Anyone? Kerosene. Kerosene. Yeah. Kerosene. Okay. Kerosene is made from what? <laughs> oil. Oil. And oil is made from what? Babies. Plants. Dead, <laughs> plants, plants and dead dinosaurs. And we are running out of that stuff. Okay, so I'm not going to get all green peas on you. I'm not going to tell you that we need to save the planet because I've spent a lot of my time working for defence contractors. But <laughs> <laughs> we've got to make more viable means of transportation. Okay, And the key to that could be the humble propeller. And the reason for that is its simplicity. In its simplest form, these things are fans that go on the front of an aircraft, they spin around and they throw air in the other direction. And Newton's third law is every action has an equal and opposite reaction, it pushes an aircraft forwards. So the big problem is, is as we try to retrofit aircraft and put propellers on them, we're putting them into situations that are wild, wildly out with the humble right flyer. And it means that we need to ensure that these propellers are strong enough. Basically they're not going to snap off, because if that happens, that would obviously be really bad. So there's two, there's two schools of thought on how we do this, and the way that they're, they're currently made, most propeller-driven aircraft you would have seen, they're just made so they're too strong. The propeller blades are really stiff, and that kind of means they're not, they're not very efficient. Okay? We can't design them to be as good as they can. And the other school of thought, which is where I go down, is to say, well, let's try and work out what the forces on these blades are. And you get some wonderful images. This is a fantastic image using something called computational fluid dynamics. And they look at all the loads on this propeller and they can work out, right, well, what's going on on this? And a similar one here, this is actually not a great image, but this is um, a bunch of guys who said, right, well, let's look at this propeller, let's look at the wing, let's look at the nacelle, that's a fancy name for the engine housing, and let's work out what all the loads are. And I think this is, is nonsense, really. I think these guys have produced some wonderfully colourful images, some great work, and I'm, I'm giving no disservice to the work they've done. But just to give an idea of this sort of computational technique, because we don't have quantum computers yet, we've only got standard computers, this sort of image would take 18 to 25 hours on a supercomputer. So if you were to run this on a high-end desktop computer, it would take several months. If you were to run it on, say, your average PC that your designer has, he or she would have to wait several years to get those results out. So you can imagine if you know, anyone works in an office, if you've left a computer in for more than a day and it's not been unplugged by a cleaner, or someone trying to plug their hi-fi in. That sort of thing's never gonna happen. So what I'm gonna try and show you today is actually this is not a very this is not a very complicated problem. And I think this is a little bit akin to trying to paint a whole room using a very fine artist paintbrush. We don't need to do that. You could probably just use the fine artist paintbrush about say around the light switches and around the other things, and you'd use a roller on the rest of it. So we need to figure out where we where we need the detail. Oh, this, these horrible looking equations, which I think are actually worse than some of the equations you may have seen today. These are the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, and we're not going to bother looking at them. But these are why those other techniques take far too long to use, okay? because they have to solve these several times for every single computation they do. So what I want to show you is, actually, we can just work out where the light switches of this problem are, where the complicated bits are. And if I can show you that on stage, we do that. So to understand how we're going to get this to work, we need to think how a propeller works. So how, do, how does a propeller work? Well, you can see them on this aircraft here. This is a C-27 Spartan. It's a wonderful aircraft. I think it looks a little bit short, really. It doesn't look right. But basically, this is a propeller. 
bunch of things on the front that spin around, okay? And they're essentially wings, wings on sticks. So we're not gonna go into the ins and outs of how wings work, because that's pretty complicated, but we can tell you the basics. So I think something that everybody here will have done at some point is stuck your hand out of the car window whilst you're driving along, right? Or as a passenger, everybody's done that. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you do that? It goes up, right? So it goes up, so you feel the wind hitting your hand and it goes up, and that's exactly how a wing works. So as these, this is my mock propeller here. It's not actually very good. It's made of paper and foam and balsa, but so is the right flyer. So we see that as I spin this around, I don't trip over, actually the whole thing lifts up. Did you guys see that? Because I was hoping I wouldn't be doing this so close to <laughs> And I think the idea was maybe not to go over your heads, but I am actually physically going over your heads. So no. what we can see is that as this thing produces lift, the whole thing bends, okay? So we know that's going to be really stressful on a propeller. So we need to think about that's, that's going to be the stressful thing, them bending, because anything that bends, what might happen to it? It might snap off. So we think about when's this going to happen a lot. So if we go back to our car analogy, those of you who drive a car or have been in a car at any point, the car generally goes in the direction it's pointed, right? Yeah, that's kind of a given. That's one of the givens of motoring. Your car goes where it's pointed. But that's not the same for an aircraft. So when an aircraft comes into land, it normally doesn't come in nose down. And why don't they do that? Because that would be catastrophic and everyone would die. So we don't do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so aircraft come in with the nose up, belly down, they come in gradually, they come in gently. And what that means is if the pilot, if they were to stick their hands out the window, like we do in our car, they'd probably lose their job. <laughs> but what they do is they'd feel some wind coming from between their, up in between their fingers. Can you imagine where that happens? That's kind of like as Buzz Light, you would say. Landing, like flying, is falling with style. <laughs> so imagine what would happen if you were one of these propeller blades and you've got this wind coming from beneath here. What would happen there? So we're going to go back to another car analogy. I've got loads of analogies because I'm not actually very good at engineering. I'm just good with words. <laughs> so to think about what would happen here, if you were, imagine you're driving on a roundabout now. Okay? You're driving in your roundabout, you are this propeller blade. If it was a normal day, you keep your hand out the window. You're only endangering imaginary passengers. Keep your hand out the window, it's going to get blown upwards. So if it was a windy day, there was a constant wind going from, say, north to south. When you were on the west point of the roundabout, your hand would be pushed up more, because you'd have the wind going towards it. And 180 degrees later, when you're on the east side of it, I think, when you're the east side of it, there would be less wind going towards it, because it'd be coming from behind, so it would go down. And that's exactly <coughs> what happens on a propeller blade. So as it comes into land, I'll keep that there. As it comes into land, when it's at one point, it gets bent up more. And when it's at another point, it gets bent down less. Bends up, bends down. Bends up, bends down. And these things spin pretty damn fast. They spin at around 850 <coughs> revolutions per minute. So, some of you, I'm looking, some of the old, I'm looking at some of the older people, not saying who they are, and some of the hipsters probably know what 33 and 45 revolutions per minute are like, roughly. So I think maybe nearly 50 times faster than that is how fast these things go. So they're bending up and down, up and down, up and down. So again, something else that everybody here will have done at some point <coughs> is taking a paper clip and you can unbend it. And you can then normally play around with it because you're bored, you don't really like your job, you're not happy with your life. So you bend it around. <laughs> <laughs> and you bend it once, twice, three. I did it earlier, I tried it, I got six bends. And then what happens? It snaps. And that's because of something called material fatigue. And there's a really very famous, almost related example that I can't help but give. Is anybody here, again, trying not to make it obvious, I'm looking at the older people, know what happened to the de, the de Havilland Comet aircraft? Anyone? What happened? It crashed. There were three of them. They didn't crash. They fell apart in the middle of the sky because of this problem. So I reckon that in the last five minutes of the, on stage, I've shown you actually this problem's not that complicated. We can look at the simple parts of it. We can work out where the most important parts are to model. And obviously, when I'm doing this in my job at work, I'll, I'll say, actually, well, I can get rid of the Reynolds terms. I can get rid of the inertial terms. I can, I'll actually do the maths behind it. But I've just shown you that, actually, it's a really simple problem. And if it's a simple problem, you have a simple solution. So we don't need to use the big, complicated methods. And as much as they produce pretty answers, there's a really simple solution. And that's what my PhD is doing, coming up with the simple solution to what is actually quite a simple problem. And I think that could really probably be carried forth into a lot of science and engineering, where we get lots of lovely answers, but really there's probably quite a simple one staring you in the face.
tonight. Thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Mm. It's been a wonderful audience. Thank you.